Yes, it's that thing. The thing what it said. This is that. This is Diddy Kong Racing on the N64. This is probably the racing game I've spent the most time with, and for good reason. It's a great game. To this day, I will defend this game as being the best racing game I think I've ever played. Best kart racer, certainly. And I mean, it's by Rare back in the day when Rare was actually making good stuff. So, I mean, if nothing else, there's that. The story follows Timber the Tiger. You know, that one character no one ever played as. His parents leave him in charge of his magical island, including its magical indentured genie servant, because reasons. And now a horrible, evil space wizard pig is out to cause some mischief. So he calls his buddy Diddy Kong to lend some star power to this title because he cannot carry this title alone. Seriously, no one played as Timber the Tiger. And so we have Diddy Kong Racing instead of Timber the Tiger Racing because no one would have remembered this game for that. Although, weirdly enough, with the exception of the Kremlin character, there's no other Donkey Kong character in this game. What is interesting, though, is this game features a pre-Kazooie Banjo and a pre-Bad Fur Day Conker, who is a lot more innocent in this game, but still just as much of a dick. And hey, Tip Top showed up in more things after this as a side character. Like, twice. Okay, so this game is mostly using completely new characters, which is why when they decided to remake this game without, like, any of Rare's licensed characters, they didn't really have to remove many of them. In fact, they had to remove two. But still, you know, there's, there's some recognizable characters if you're into the Rare mythos. And what comes across is probably the thing that struck me the most about this game when I was a kid, and even now, is it doesn't just go down a list of, okay, you pick your character, now pick whatever race course you want to go through, or whatever GP tournament style race style you want to go to. No, it goes WHAM! Adventure mode. Because you're immediately thrown into an island, which is basically a hub to get to your other races. So it's basically a glorified menu where it basically just wastes your time. But there are hidden secrets and extra challenges and stuff, so you know what? So even though it is just a bunch of extra busy work to have this giant hub world, I still kind of like it. In fact, I remember quite a lot of time when I was a kid, I'd just fly around the island just for fun. Like, not even doing the races, just, you know, exploring the giant hub world, even though it only has, like, five collectibles in it. So, you know, even though this one particular feature isn't necessarily all that well utilized in this game, it's still pretty cool that it's there. Now, while you're on the island, you can hop into one of five, okay, well, four, and then after you beat the game, a fifth world. And from those five worlds, you can then select up to four individual tracks you can race in that world, as well as a fifth bonus sort of multiplayer map style thing that can be played entirely single player, which is fantastic. And those are usually like goofy challenges like collect X before your enemy gets it or steal stuff from your enemy, or just standard deathmatch stuff because Mario Kart did it and we can do it too, and it's probably better here even though there's only four maps. Once you beat the main tracks in any one world, you can then go and challenge the boss, which is both equal parts combat and racing, because you ultimately have to beat the boss in a race, but they're going to be actively attacking you, so you have to actually try and avoid them the entire time. The structure of this game is just kind of mind-boggling, and what's more impressive in terms of structure is the fact that you're not just driving on a go-kart. Sure, you've got your standard go-kart, which has some weird speed nonsense going on with it. Seriously, just tap the A button instead of pulling it down, you go twice as fast for some reason. But you also have a hovercraft, which can go on the water, but is really slippery to control, and an airplane, which is kind of in the middle in terms of controls, but you're flying, so it's actually harder to hit some of the bonus stuff around each map. Because, like any good kart game, there's weapons to be had. You have red balloons, which are missiles. You have blue balloons, which are speed boosts. You have yellow balloons, which are a shield. You have rainbow colored balloons, which are a type of magnet, which automatically like pulls you towards the person in front of you. And finally you have green balloons, which are basically road hazard. And I have to be a little bit vague about that because these items actually have a leveling system that changes what they are. And you level them by collecting one color of a balloon and then collecting another one of that same color. The thing about this, is if you collect another one, suddenly your balloon is replaced. 
So you actually have to be driving in a rather strategic way in order to upgrade your equipment. But the upgrades for the blue balloon are a better boost up to three levels. The red balloon, one upgrade turns it into a homing missile, and then the second upgrade turns it into 10 standard missiles, which I'm not really sure if that's necessarily an upgrade over a homing missile, but still, you know, you've got some strategic variants in your equipment. The yellow balloons turn to better shields. The green balloons that drop road hazards are an oil spill, these like spiky mine type things, and like this giant anti-vehicle bubble that removes you from the racetrack for a short period of time, which is just ridiculously frustrating. And of course, if you upgrade the magnets, well, you got a stronger magnet that's a little more effective. So while the overall pull of items is lesser than its greatest competition at the time, Mario Kart, the use of upgrading them and requiring you to play strategically in order to do so well and figure out when you need to do so really makes it a lot more interesting. And hey, there's no stupid blue turtle shell bullshit here. It's pretty much entirely all skill based on trying to aim weapons and trying to figure out the timing on certain things. That's amazing. And speaking of blue turtle shells, did you ever find those obnoxious? Don't answer that because literally everyone did. But more importantly, those things were incredibly cheap ways of attempting to balance a game that ended up basically feeling random and not really all that difficult. Where am I going with this? Well, another way to do that is a system known as rubber banding. It's quite famous in racing games. Basically, if you're behind a previous racer, they'll slow down a little bit so you can catch up. And if you're ahead, they'll speed up faster than theoretically possible just to try and catch up with you. It's a system that's designed to constantly keep you on your toes and make every race feel like a race to the finish, so to speak. This game doesn't have that, which is why if you're paying attention to some of the go-kart moments, because again, tapping the A button makes you go twice as fast for some reason, I am blowing the competition away in some of these races, just because there's none of that. Everything moves at the same relatively fair pace, which is kind of interesting. I mean, it also means that if you get behind, they're not waiting for you, but you know what? I think I can accept that. Now, we've already talked about some of the collectibles in this game, but, I mean, it's a rare game. There is a metric butt ton of collectibles in this game. We've already talked about the weapon balloons, but there are gold balloons. These are your sort of Super Mario stars. Every time you win a race, you get one. And you can collect two from every stage. One before you beat the boss, the second time after. But there's a little extra condition, because now you have to collect silver coins in every mission and then come in first, which is really hard on some levels. Next are the hidden keys in every world. Every world has one and, well, I mean, come on, world one. It's right out in front of the starting line. But some of these keys are actually really well hidden and they unlock those bonus single-player multiplayer deathmatch nonsense tracks you can get amulets for beating those multiplayer levels you get an amulet for collecting all the silver coins and then beating the boss and that amulet's used to fight the final boss you can get a trophy for doing a marathon of all the tracks in one world but this leads me to one of my complaints about this which is while there's about 20 tracks across the five worlds of this game which is not a small number. That blows pretty much all of its competition out of the water right then and there. If you want to collect 100% of everything in the game, excluding the second playthrough, because yes, there's a new game plus second playthrough that asks you to do it all again, but harder, well, you gotta go through each track at least four times. And that kind of feels like unnecessary padding. It would be nice if they could have, instead of having you do every map four times, Maybe cut that in half and have twice as many stages, or cut that into quarters and give you four times as many stages, but I mean, you start with 20 maps, and honestly, having 80 maps on an N64 cartridge probably wouldn't work in terms of data storage. Or if it did, this game would probably run ridiculously poorly, but still, it kind of sucks they ask you to beat the game basically four times to 100% the game once. And if you count the second playthrough, well, you're running through every track at least eight times. And that is assuming you don't fail at any point. Still, given the fact that they had basically five different environments to work with, the fact that they came up with 20 different racetracks that are all legitimately unique and interesting and fun to play is mind-blowing. Because instead of trying to like throw out all the assets and have individual tracks, they're all themed, which allows them to use their assets further, which means that we actually got quite a few memorable tracks without having to expand the amount of memory this game requires at any one point, and that's an excellent use of space. Because again, you can't fit like 80 tracks on an N64 cart and have it work terribly well without like a giant expansion 
and we all know the N64DD didn't exactly work out now, did it? The tracks are fantastic. All of them are a complete blast and absolutely memorable to play. I mean, I hadn't picked this game up in probably about 20 years, and I remember all these tracks just off the top of my head. I freaking love it. You've got different vehicles, you've got tons of things to collect, and you've got a giant adventure world that really should have had more stuff in it to explore, but still, the overall gameplay to this game is tremendously full of replayability. Now the presentation too, Timber Tiger's Island Raceorama is pretty damn awesome. I mean, all the characters are full of individual personality, it's great, they look fantastic, the tracks are unique and interesting, and again, they're working with a set number of assets for each world, but they still come across as all completely unique with their own personality and flair and landmarks. And I mean, come on, it's a rare game. The soundtrack is gonna be awesome. Even today, with the crap they're shoveling out for the Kinect, Rare's always been able to produce a great soundtrack. They know their composers. And this game is absolutely fantastic. Again, like I said, it's been about 20 years since I've played this game, but I instantly remember all these songs. In fact, even in my head right now, before I'm editing all this stuff together and putting the background audio in, I'm having trouble like making Sophie's Choice trying to figure out what songs I have to leave out because they're just so good. Oh, I do not envy future me having to edit the audio to this. But seriously, presentation of this game is amazing. Now, if you want a copy of Diddy Kong Racing on the N64, it can be had for about $25. That is $25 well spent, especially if you like kart racing games like Mario Kart, because I mean, I will forever preface this to be the best kart racer ever. And that is in a world where the fantastic Mario Kart Double Dash exists. I have really got to find a copy of that again, but still, this game is amazing. Now you might be noticing that I'm playing the Japanese version. I actually do have a North American copy, and the only reason I'm playing the Japanese version is grabbing the North American copy would have been two extra steps. Seriously, it's the exact same game. The only differences are there's Japanese text instead of English text, and on one level there is one missing face of a piece of geometry that could allow you to clip outside the environment and try and get some high score speed times if you really want to fly in that invisible no man's land nonsense but honestly other than that is the complete same game except whereas the north american copy cost 25 dollars the japanese copy cost me 30 cents seriously japanese importing is awesome but this game is fantastic. It is a must-have for kart racing fans. It's a must-have for rare fans. It's a must-have for racing fans. There was also a DS copy. We don't talk about that. Don't get that game. Get this game. It's awesome. Yes, the DS copy did add the greatest of Kongs, Dixie Kong. And while I miss her greatly in this game, I mean, this game is just better in every respect. But seriously, Diddy Kong Racing on the N64, it is a must-have racing game for any racing game fan.